Martin, welcome to episode 101 of uh, the Illuminating Rounds. Uh, how are we doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I never thought we'd get to 101. That feels well, it feels it feels like a bigger milestone than than 100. In does a way. it? Well, yeah. You wait to 102. We, uh, oh, <laughs> can't wait for 102. <laughs> <laughs> so much better than the last one. Um, yeah. We've got lots to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about double blind scenarios. We're going to talk about the ASL gap and uh, nice guy Chris Gammon that I caught up with this week. Uh, we're going to talk about the Sparrow Force campaign. I'm going to talk about some updates to the Scenario Archive uh, for the map data. And also we're going to talk about the tournament and where we are with that. So lots to lots to get through. Um, what have you been up to? You've been all good. Yeah, I've been very I've been very busy. You've been doing the house and the garden up. We've had some some nice weather in between the the, the, the rain. Yep. So it's been good. Yeah, I walked to, I walked to Cambridge, twelve miles on the Roman Road the other wow. day. Wow. That was uh, that was that was spectacular. Yeah. And this is in training for your walk across Scotland. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, at the narrowest possible conceivable point, we're walking across Scotland. Yeah. Walking across the country is not. Yeah, that's it's something. No mean feat. Yeah. Yeah. Great down down the Great Glen, and we're wild camping. If I hadn't already said that on illuminating rounds, so we're we're camping where we where we fall at the end of the day. Yeah. Ah, it's exciting. Exciting stuff. Mm. Exciting. Mm. Um, Are you gonna uh, Are you gonna enjoy the Scottish whiskey up there and? I suspect so. I mean, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to go all the way to Scotland for a week and not not have a little bit, try a little bit of, of whiskey. I don't know that it tastes different up there, <laughs> but it just feels oh. like while you're up there, yeah, you've got to win in Scotland. Yeah, exactly. Moan and drink whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Alex, our infamous and famous uh, Welsh champion, sent us mm. uh, a copy of the, well, yes, he sent me the original, of the ASL mm. Gap. Uh, utility that was uh, around a long, long time ago. 1993 is when I think it was released. Um, you don't know very much about the ASL Gap program? Not really. I know about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. So basically, it's um, it's an application. I'm going to put some screenshots now of, uh, and you know, just kind of showing how, how it gets used on the screen. But um, basically, it's a, an application that is a general assistance program for uh, ASL play-in. So the idea was you would put it next to your game and then you would use it to roll dice uh to do the to hit values to kills and it's like a game aid for things like even things like battlefield integrity which is um, a huge i think a huge thing um but it has a lot of nice little features like um reminding you about uh, potential multiple hits if you're rolling on a particular you know you set up what your caliber of gun size is and if it rolls a double mm. it will know these kind of bits and pieces um and yeah i mean it's, it's a fairly you know comprehensive program um, and so uh, I couldn't, obviously, I don't have a floppy disk reader anymore. And I know you can probably buy them on, online or whatever. But um, I took the easy route out and decided just to contact Chris Gammon, who wrote the program. Now, Chris is a uh, long time um, supporter of the, the, the Scenario Archive. So he was um, doing a, a like a, a recurring uh, donation through through PayPal long before we did any of this kind of stuff. And um yeah. and, very very shockingly I, I didn't put the two guys together i always remembered there was a guy called chris that would pay this kind of you know a couple of dollars each each month just for the, the archive and it was a very nice thing that he did and then for whatever reason that stopped you know a year or so ago which whilst we were talking he reinstated again because he'd forgotten about it which was crazy enough for him to mm. but he um he then it, it kind of sprung to my oh this is this chris and it's chris gammon so i you know managed to have a, a like an hour-long conversation with him talking to him about the how it all came about and everything and had a very good conversation chris is one of these really good guys in asl that we don't hear a lot about they just kind of like flow under the surface doing good deeds really yeah and obviously one of them was writing the the asl gap but um he's also doing this like he's raising money for um i think for vassal uh via doing some kind of um wooden puzzle engraving something right i don't quite know what what it, what it was but you know these are the things that he does to to raise money for you know the, the kind of the people that support the hobby so chris is definitely one of the good guys in the in the world yeah and he was telling me that basically he wrote this application to try and help with squad leader and he saw don greenwood at, um i think or maybe he wrote don greenwood or he saw him at a conference like a, a um, a games kind of convention thing and sort of said to him look you know i've got some problems here you know the rules don't make a lot of sense in these you know they, they, there's some conflicts here i can't resolve them 
And Donna said kind of something along the lines of, well, look, if, you know, if the computer can't resolve it, we have a problem here. I don't know, maybe Chris was the reason why Advanced Squad Leader came out in the first place, as far as I know. I don't yeah, know. yeah. That was the thing. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, Don said, well, look, you know, does it handle critical hits? And does it handle this, that, and the other? Because he started writing it for ASL as well. And um, Chris has said, yeah, it does. It does all this. And so Don was really impressed and said, OK, look, well, go ahead and, you know, finish it off and we'll we'll support you. And so they ended up producing it and Avalon Hill published it. And so mm. it got published and you could you could buy it for, you know, I don't I don't actually know what the the actual cost of the the, the application yeah. was itself. But, you know, maybe twenty dollars or so. I don't know. Um, but Chris received, you know, less than I think less than a dollar per copy for in he told me it Excellent. sold. 600 oh no 1600 copies it sold um so you know you know it, it, it sold but it's it didn't didn't sell uh, yeah, you know yeah. amazingly well um and so you know chris also then became like a play tester as well and for all his efforts he was given a counter so there is a there is a, a gammon counter and mm. if you look at it it's um it's a six plus one counter <laughs> <laughs> so, like for all his efforts he gets a six plus one which is still you know nothing to be ashamed yeah. of of course you know i know it's great to have a counter yeah right 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 so we um we started chatting about it i started talking talk about the fact that you know you kind of do but don't have a counter because you know this bar yes to say you might as well. it's so a bar he, but not named after me it's a better it's, it's a nine minus or is he eight, eight minus eight, one, minus one. eight so minus one, yeah. the barker it's named after is a guy called paul barker who was a play yeah. tester along with chris in chris's group so oh, he knows him. so yeah. he tells him a story about it he says um he said so barker's got a counter in there and everything and he says that they were playing uh, a scenario and the i think he had a 7-0 leader and he calls down some oba and it hits his own leader and yeah. as part of it it wounds down to a six plus one and so he said oh he goes like paul picks up the phone he goes ah oh, it must be for you you know because obviously <laughs> chris is the six plus one leader um, it's very very funny but um yeah, yeah so really nice to talk to to chris um, yeah. great story yeah. did it in uh, quick basic took him took him a couple of years to write you know all in total um and now he's also got i think he's got a 10 minus one leader as well uh in i think a japanese leader i think he's got as well mm. now he's been upgraded so yeah but, uh, actually, writing it must be quite a complex process i mean obviously you know a little bit about programming but just to, to kind of program the, the rules and the complexity of the rules that's yeah great. a lot of it's just i think just table lookups but i mean taking nothing away from it yeah. it's definitely yeah and it was yeah. you know, it's really quite nicely done for its time so um yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're trying to get a copy of that speak to chris chris gammon he can um he can help you out and um yeah chris is still an active active player and yeah. uh, enjoying himself doing all those bits and pieces but very nice to talk to him and thank you again alex yeah. for for sending that over and um mm. yeah if you I'm, I'm interested like you know would you would you martin use the gap I, I can't i can't see how it's beneficial because presumably you've got to put some in, input some data um in order to make it work and it, I don't know, isn't it just, I, I, I just, I just feel, I mean, I've not tried it, so I don't know, but it just feels to me that it's easier to, to process, you know, do those calculations yourself rather yeah. than telling it what gun it is and like what's yeah. the range. And, so, so hmm. for example, on, on the gap program, so you, you, yeah, you absolutely do that, but it's um, what you kind of do is you set up the, um, like the, the kind of parameters for each gun. So you say, okay, hmm. we've got a 75 meter, mid meter, and I've got a 57 double L, Mm. And then you kind of select which one's firing and then it mm. rolls, you know, that's a hit and we'll tell you, okay, if it's this range, it's a hit. And if it's not a hit, it's I not see. a hit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's actually been done in a way where it is quite user friendly. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely for, for its mm. time, which, you know, didn't, mm. you know, the, the nineties weren't the pinnacle of UI obviously, design. Yeah. You obviously haven't got Microsoft windows and stuff right. like that. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly that. So, um, yeah. yeah, it was very good. And so, you know, it's what I think the, the thing it was kind of missing, that I think would have been really useful was the, the OBA flow chart. Yeah. So, you know, it kind of asks you, okay, well, where are you? Right. Can you do this? Can you, do this? And, and give you the, the thing, because that seemed to be the, the really useful part of the, where mm. people I think need the most help sometimes in ASL. Yeah. Um, okay. But to be fair, it was really, you know, it's really nicely done. He, he did a great job of it. Um, and yeah, I think you know, it's all, all, uh, all credit to uh, mm. both, both him Probably for so. writing it. And also to be fair, Avalon Hill for, for publishers yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. Was, uh, 
I was going to say we should have a go one day, but of course we can't. We can't run the program, can we? No, we can. We can run it. I've, I've got it running. I've got it running. Okay. okay. So yeah, perhaps we'll have a go on. We'll have a go yeah. on it one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Mm. It's, um, I think it's definitely one of those things where, you, and it, the other thing it does, which obviously you know you kind of spoil it within in Vassal now, is it will record all your dice stats, so you can kind of see your averages and yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff, which you know we take for granted now in in Vassal, but. Um, certainly, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't that long ago that we were exporting data and putting it either into the archive or into other applications to kind of look at the look at the numbers and see what was um, yeah what was being kind of averaged out and everything. But that's that. There we go. So Brilliant. Good job, Chris, yeah. and thanks again, Alex. Um, yeah. Double blind scenarios, Martin. Mm, so yeah, well, you've played two. We put the first one we played. I quite enjoyed it. Was at your 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 flat, so it was quite a long time ago now. And I, I can't remember whether I won or not, but I remember enjoying it. So I wonder if perhaps it went well for me. <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't remember to be, to be clear, clear. But I did have quite a good memory of it. I quite like that idea of kind of not quite knowing what's um, what's coming, because of course there's a there's a realism element there, isn't there, which is lacking in the in the game where you see you see everything, you know you know what turn the enemy units are coming on. I was, but I didn't enjoy the one we did so much, partly because. I kind of like mucked up some of the setup rules. Really so we should we should explain what double blind is for yeah. people that don't know. Yeah, we, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Go on, go ahead. Um, I'll do that. Yeah. So so basically, the idea is that you get a scenario card, but you only really find out what you've what forces you've got, um, uh, and what reinforcements you've got. You know what your victory conditions are, and you know that you need to have more points than your opponent, but you don't know what your opponent's victory conditions are. Although they tend to be pretty much the mirror opposite don't they yeah, sort of thing you know i've got to get cvp and you know your enemy's got to get cvp but you don't know that at the beginning you also don't know what force they've got but you do get a sort of a, a kind of a description of it you know expect there to be some light tanks you know and they're going to be they're going to be approaching from the north or whatever but i was i was totally taken by surprise when by your, your reinforcements because you brought a force on and i thought right this is it the game's on not realizing that was your that was your kind of um you know, just one of your forces. <laughs> That's another right. one coming on as well. Yeah. So it's in- it is interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, so I'm not sure if I'm a big fan, but it's interesting. That's right. Mm. It, it is. It does give you a really nice challenge, and I think I think it is mm. one of those ones where it's really quite a fun thing. So we play cro- Crossroads at Sui Sui. Yes. Susie. S U X Y. Okay, Susie. Sorry, I was I couldn't remember which where the I and the X were. Yeah. But okay, yeah. So I'm attacking. Um. So let's uh, let's take a look at the initial scenario. So before we um, before we jump into this, I should say that this kind of bit of video will contain spoilers for Crossroad at Susie. So for those that are thinking about playing it, <laughs> maybe maybe close, skip. close your eyes now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> think about whether you really want to watch this bit because obviously yeah. this yeah. will this will affect this will affect things. Yeah. So before we start, let's listen to Toby's pre-game thoughts as to what's going on in this scenario. Okay, so I'm hoping to provide a bit of commentary on the um, on the uh, double blind scenario uh, for Dave and Martin and um, uh, going through, you know, turns as well, however many of them there are. <laughs> so first of all, just looking at double blind scenarios, uh, which there aren't many of, um, First of all, really, uh, it does seem to me that um, I suppose the nearest you can get are the things we have very below Bs or um, campaign games. But of course, even in those, you know what your potential, what you're potentially facing. Uh, for example, in um, you know whether you in a Stalingrad campaign game, whether the the, the Germans may have um, some Stukas coming over. You know, you can factor that in and think, oh, well, they may have some. But in, in this scenario that Dave and Martin are going to play, they've, they've really got no idea what uh, what they're facing. Um, um, so what that does, of course, is it increases uncertainty. And when you increase the uncertainty and fog of war in a scenario, uh, uncertainty means the unknown. And the unknown means fear, you know, so... What I'm expecting is often uh, extra caution, um, and extra caution is normally bad in ASL. Not always, but usually. Um, and I would say that uh, that could be a problem mostly for the attacker. 
um, where you know you want to press and, and crack on in the game. And if you're fearful, you'll tend to be slower in your attack. And it will be interesting to see if that occurs. And what I'm hoping to see is that Dave actually <clears throat> does uh, attack aggressively in the face of the unknown. But looking at their um, looking at their respective setups, I've got a few observations to make. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make comments on what each player can see. Um, so with regard to um, Martin's defensive setup, uh, I'm not going to comment on his um, hip placement. Uh, I'm just looking at the board as if I was Dave attacking. <clears throat> and what I'll do is I'll make, well, having said that, I can make some, I will make some other observations in that what uh, Martin could have presented <clears throat> um, to, to Dave if he'd wish to do so. <clears throat> and I'll make two observations. One is, I think one mistake that uh, Martin has made is uh, an easy one to make, a bit of a schoolboy error, is even though he has no um, tanks or AFVs, he could have used his um, dummy counters to um, dummy some, couldn't he? He could have, um, you know, in concealment terrain, he could have placed some um, in, you know, decent positions in pairs, probably, to make it look as if uh, they were in, um, you know, he placed them so they could take advantage of platoon movement. Um, and uh, that would have slowed down um, Dave considerably, I think. <clears throat> um, so that's a, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I should say that one of the um, groups of, that um, Martin sets up is uh, is not only in a, it's the anti tank he calls it the anti tank section, but it's not only anti tank guns. It also consists of some half squads that have got medium machine guns, and it says that they set up hip. It does not, on the scenario card, specify that they have to set up hip in concealment terrain, and uh, you know. Given that 99.9% .9 of the time, if you're allowed to set up infantry units, uh, HIP, it does specify in concealment terrain. Um, I do wonder whether that's a mistake on the scenario card. However, we're playing it as if it's um, as written, you know. So what that means is, technically speaking, Martin could set up units, infantry units, you know, a couple of half squads or whatever, um, with medium machine guns in open ground of course uh, they'll be placed on the table as soon as units can see them under concealment at least so uh, we'll see what he's done with those um, and the other thing I'd say about uh, Martin's setup is he seems to have completely discounted the possibility of uh, Dave entering on the eastern board edge even though in his own scenario card it does suggest that that could occur so, uh, you know, has he has he been fiendishly cunning and is thinking about that and has set up a, an ambush? Uh, it doesn't look like it. So um, that that that's also interesting. Uh, as for Dave's attack, I mean, um, I was thinking that he could have kept a stug or two, perhaps back on the first turn, uh, because he can enter on or after turn two, of course. Um, um, but he's going for the, it looks like he's going for the, <coughs> um, village. And I think, I mean, the interesting thing about, one of the interesting things about scenarios is these multiple victory conditions. And, uh, Dave's basically got to achieve a majority of them in order to win. But what I'd like to see him is, is for him to concentrate on, on some right at the start of the game. It looks like that's what he's going to do. It looks like he's going to go for the village. That's one victory point. Uh, all he has to do is take a few prisoners. It's not a colossal amount, which if he can get around behind the French um, with his flankers, he should be able to amass loads of uh, prisoners. And then as long as he doesn't lose all his stugs, he should be able to achieve the uh, victory condition with regards to 
not losing enough men and that will give him three victory points which will get in the win he doesn't even have to worry about the um, the hill or the building on the other edge so um so yeah there's there's that <clears throat> i mean i'd say i'd like to see dave uh, deploy a bit send half squads forward uh, as scouts uh, also up onto the hill because then he'll get view of all the other hill hexes and i'd like to see him be aggressive on turn one um, um but not foolish you know so um he should be able to cx lots of half squads forward and then squads moving separately i think he could be aggressive with a couple of uh, stugs if he wanted to um the only reason to be aggressive with them would be to send them forward so that they can once someone shoots at a squad he could send a stug forward to pump some a smoke discharge or some vehicle grenades to um you know if he, if he has reason to do so or to attempt to to do so of course i think other stugs could go up onto the hill you know in his backfield <laughs> um and take out overwatch positions um so i think he should be cautious with a couple of stugs but could be aggressive with one or two um uh, but we'll see how things go so i am the attacking germans up on the up on the north side mm -hmm. uh i know that i'm facing i think an armored cavalry uh company yeah. battalion elements or something like that um yeah and my victory conditions really are to clear this hill um which is which is here yeah mine is to, to hang on to that yes oh. uh i've got to try and um capture this kind of uh, building down the bottom here yeah and and my victory condition is to hang on to that building right right <laughs> uh and also i've got to try and get you out of all the um multi hex yeah. buildings over here which mm. is <laughs> looks like quite the tough job when it I've does seen... i mean there are dummies as well right which yeah, i don't I... know I, and the thing is i don't know there's dummies um, no so no. this is the thing that dummies really work well in these kind of things because i have no idea yeah. if there's one unit there or that's or 100 yeah um so this and this is i've got to say this is the strength of the asl system when we take away that omniscience of the the player in that mm. you really understand now like you know the things that all are trying to do like you know the halving of the firepower and the extra mm. chit draw during an, uh, uh, an ova attack when you just see these things you really realize okay we have no idea what's going on um mm. So I don't know if you've got any uh, tanks. I don't know if you've got any anti-tank guns. Yeah, um, yeah. I've got some Stugs in the um, in the OOB. I think they're Stug 2s, and I think we haven't got any Stug 2s. So I think we go with Stug 1s, or maybe the other way around. I can't remember. Mm. Um, so basically, I, I push ahead, and, and suddenly mm. I'm seeing some hip. I think this was yeah. a truck, was it? I can't remember what, what this was. That's that, just, that is just a truck, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you start to show some bits and pieces here. Now, this is where we, we've already got the rules wrong. Or yeah. I've already got the rules wrong. It's a, essentially, I could set units up on that hill hip. Right. Um, and so I set them up. Well, no, I, I could set up certain units hip, and I set them up hip on that hill. Um, but you can't set up hip unless you're in concealment terrain. And that's a, that's an ASL rule rather than an SSL. An ASL rule, yeah. And normally they say, don't they, that you can set up hip in concealment train in the in the scenario card, but that's sort of irrelevant because they for you, you you that's that's just an ASL rule. Right. The other thing is that we looked it up together and we managed to get wrong together. That I only that that they become available. They, you should be able to see them as soon as you got line of sight to them because they're in open ground. But we thought that because they had height advantage, right. That um, that they could can retain their hip status right the on. but the issue was here is that i'm on the, t the first level hill and here you're even on the first level of yeah. the hill yes yeah. so that's the third mistake that i made yeah. <laughs> so the problem is and this is this is one of the downsides with um with double blind scenarios is yeah. i can't help you because i don't know no what's going on no. um yeah and so i'm just pushing forward here and yeah. this yeah. is kind of the you know this is the thing which is I have to just. I'm take already it starting to think it looks quite difficult, though. For you or for me? <laughs> for me. Oh right. I wasn't well, enjoying it at all. I was thinking, ah, oh, it's just. I didn't know what to do with the horses. I didn't know yes. what to do with the cavalry. And it might be Toby's got some suggestions about that, perhaps. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we're going to listen. We'll 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 put we'll his tapes. Yeah, his first, his pre-game thoughts, and his second one. But this is this mm. is after term one, so we'll, mm. we'll we'll kind of stop here and we'll listen to Toby's thoughts at mm. this point. Okay, here's my thoughts um, after the German turn one. Um, I should say I can't observe the uh, the game as it as it occurs. I'm just looking at snapshots. So I've got a uh, Dave sent me a post. German turn one snapshot and um, the first thing I'll say is it does look like having reread the hip rules uh, it definitely says that non-emplaced guns if they're setting up hip must set up in concealment terrain now that's in the rule book so uh, I guess it turns out that um, that placement of the half squads with the medium machine guns was illegal on the hill um and also that stuff that does set up hip in non-concealment terrain is placed on board under a concealment counter immediately when there is a line of sight to it no matter if the line of sight is obscured or anything um so that's interesting and um viewing that <clears throat> i much prefer to keep my hip stuff hip for as long as possible which means i nearly always place it in concealment terrain and uh, i think that's what i would have um done um, i understand why martin put it on the hill it's got a good line of sight and it comes as a surprise uh, but i think he would have been better off placing his squads from the outlying elements there which was four squads and a light machine and the leader you know they could have been if you want to have something on the hill then uh, I'd have thought they'd have been um, the perfect choice. Um, I mean, Dave's first full turn seems fine. I mean, I'm assuming half, in, half squads were scouting forward. He got some fire support on the hill. I mean, personally, I'd have stacked the medium with the heavy to make it a 12 firepower shot. What I don't understand, though, is why a pair of Stugs close to six hex range of a known gun um, when I say known gun um, uh, some sort of gun under a concealment counter um, I mean did, did Dave know it was a 20 mil gun and thought it can't penetrate it, his front um, had he forgotten the deliberate immobilization rules or, or just thought oh well he'll, he'll need a four or less or whatever if I'm a small target so um, it's very unlikely I just feel that those Stugs perhaps could have stayed back on the hill where his fire support was, um, thereby helping to turn the victory point hill of Martin's into virtually a death trap. I mean, he, Martin can't skulk on that hill with anything. So um, you can just sort of pour fire onto it or dump smoke on anything um, that's, uh, that's a threat. So we'll see how turn two goes. All right, so yeah, just in response, I guess, to Toby's comments. So yeah, the um, the Stugs definitely um, decided that they would get closer to the um, the known gun as, as quickly as they could, um, more to try to stop um, the reinforcements. I, I I thought that I wanted to cut off the the left hand side of the uh, the hill, so this mm. area here off from your your guys, and so yeah. the the point there was um, to pull back and to stop you. You know, to try and discourage you from coming across to defend the hill, um, yeah. and I felt that there was um, at, at this point, I think in the turn, I don't know that there's a gun there on the, on no. the hill. It's coming no. soon. Um, yeah. So I, I you know, should know, but you don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but yeah. So the the plan is to try and stop you cutting off, and then try to get eyes on this on this hill. That's that's the thing. Mm. Um, I hadn't. I hadn't really kind of comprehended the in terms of the CVPs. But my my victory condition said that um, I had to gain, I had to amass, uh, well, I had to not suffer thirty CVPs worth of points, mm. and I had to have the uh, the French suffer at least twenty five points of CVP to get a point. Yeah, um, I didn't attribute that to. I I was kind of. I was trying to talk to you a bit before about it. I like to think that, okay, if you're amassing CVP, then of course, if you're killing squads, that's CVP. And if you're capturing squads, that's CVP. But I hadn't put 
it, it feels a bit strange when you reverse it and say that the French mustn't suffer those CP, CVP, that obviously prisoners would double that amount. So I hadn't really kind of comprehended that just grabbing more prisoners would push you a little bit higher towards that number. Sure, um, yeah. But I had I had no idea. I didn't honestly didn't know how I was going to take. I thought the hill would be the easy one. I yeah. couldn't work out how I was going to get this building at the back, and I couldn't see me clearing out your guys here. I mean, I just just felt like it yeah. was an impossible task. Yeah. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, turn turn two, uh, where I do get the um, these eastern reinforcements. And <laughs> the funny thing about this one was I was joking with you about. Oh, you know, what about when reinforcements coming on the right hand side? And you were like, oh, yeah. geez, that's obviously not happen. Let's not be silly about that. And then, of course, they all come flying on, which was, uh, yeah. which was yeah. quite fun. Um, I think I did know that you had a gun because you left, you left some counters up here. Um, all right. <laughs> so you left some artillery pieces up. So I was, I was particularly nervous about that, but then yeah. they were with the wagon counters. So, oh, so those are reinforcements. Yeah, but I had no idea what what yeah, that was doing. Yeah, on. So yeah, I just assumed, yeah. okay, well, there's no no guns just yet. Um, mm. But that's that's a tip for for people that play the stories. Mm. Don't leave your reinforcements unhit mm. anywhere. Um, so okay, pushing on to yeah. uh, your turn, your turn one, and mm. I'm actually my turn two now. Yeah, where um, the Stugs start running over the hill. Yeah, and. At this point, I think hmm. at this point, you suddenly reveal a gun that we have kind of no idea. So we all got a bit confused at this point. What to do? We all got a bit confused. Yeah. Um, this is not. This is not me at my best. It's not. It's probably probably not us at our best. I don't know. Yeah, I felt a bit <laughs> hamstrung by this. I wasn't quite sure what I could do to <laughs> to fix this problem. Um, so we decided that okay, well, what what would we have done here? Yeah, uh, and I think that the deal was okay. I think maybe I'd, I'd have taken a shot or whatever. But I said, okay, look, don't worry, you can't kill my tank. Basically, you've got very little chance. Mm. So I'm just going to run up to them and I'll, I'll pepper mm. them later on. Yeah. Um. So I think what we did was we we brought the gun back, we took the shot, mm. uh, and you allowed me to pin you because I think that's what happened. If I think the uh, the guys up on the hill here would have taken the shot, I think the mortar or something something hit this yeah. this gun and pinned it. Yeah. Um, and the idea would be that I would have gone, yeah, and I would have prep fired. So he allowed me to prep fire, yeah, um, as well, but didn't have any effect really. Pinned the pinned the no. gun crew, but nothing else. And then we carried on. So that was that was that. And then of course another gun turned up. Mm. <laughs> that in theory I should have known about, but didn't. Yeah, and... no, there's no in theory about it at all. Yeah, <laughs> so, but it's okay. It's okay. Nothing. No, no harm. No foul. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't die from it. It was all no, right. no. Um, and again, I thought, okay, well, look, as long as I'm facing the front of you, this yeah. is this is no problems. But so I'm thinking it's desperate. You got guys coming in where I'm not really expecting them. I've yeah. got you've got tanks surrounding quite weak forces on the hill, really. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't feeling great. Yeah. So I pushed quite hard. But I, yeah, I, I I did a lot of damage in yeah. terms of breaking there, yeah. didn't I? You did. Yeah. And I kind of I kind of needed to get like almost one hex further into the safety of these yeah. orchards. And couldn't yeah. quite make it. Most of these guys yeah. uh, got broken or pinned. Um, yeah. The leader and then you got the there. horse thieves coming on. <laughs> the, the horse for anglers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So these guys come on. And this was one of those ones where, you know, your poker face let you down here. Because I don't know if these guys here uh, yeah. in, in this hex here are, are dummies or not. And mm. you just lost all interest in <laughs> <laughs> trying to defend this area <laughs> there was no mm, am i taking a shot no carry on there was nothing you were like yeah whatever keep going yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i thought this is hopeless absolutely hopeless it helped that i broke everything in the middle you did, I, you I did. Lie, but but at the moment i'm still not feeling great right all right yeah. um so yeah a little bit more um a little bit yeah. more advancing fire and bits and pieces but in general i'm kind of like okay well I can kind of regroup and I should be all right here. And I, yeah, I realized that yeah. I was pushing quite well into the, into the building. Mm. A little bit of a repositioning. You, I think you literally did nothing on your first turn. I don't think mm. we missed anything. I think you literally just passed the whole turn. I think, I think that's, that's pretty much right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't like we missed it. Um, yeah. So a little few advances, uh, yeah. a little bit of repositioning. I'm anxious about the Eastern force coming yes. on. They're, they're, I'm anxious about that. Yeah. Um, and then we have, 
a spectacular set of results. So we really do. Um, you, you do a little bit of firing, and it's it's yeah. kind of like you know, yeah, just normal. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually quite effective. Yeah, gosh, look, you got that whole group just like destroyed. Yeah, and in O six, yeah. Mm. So then your gun. So okay, so this guns. this gun here has. Um, deliberately mobilized this this one here. I think needed yeah. needed fours or threes or something. Hits something rate like fire. That. Yeah. Deliberately mobilizes. Turns turns the gun. Mm. Um so no problems. Rate of fire goes down by one. Mm. You turn the gun, try to hit this one. Um immobilize that one. Mm. Hit the next one. Deliberately mobilize that one as well. Um mm. and yeah. suddenly and then I was like, well, okay, well, this is all a bit of a disaster, really. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty certain something bad happens to the last one as well. Yeah. And, and at this I'm point, sure well, you're right. I mean, I don't see. Oh, so, the, so of course, then the OBA, which I try to call down. I desperately need to come down yeah. in this yeah. section here to just help me clear off the thing. Lands um, on your own forces. Lands on my own yeah. forces and basically just breaks everything. So what these... happened to your personal morale at that at that point? <laughs> <laughs> My personal morale. <laughs> then, oh yeah, but by the way, then also generated a sniper that mm. then on a one took out my... Um... Yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, it took out the... Yeah, heavy machine gun. Heavy machine gun guys as well. Yeah. yeah. And that was it. That was like, right, okay. Yeah. You know, gener it was just <laughs> enough misery. <laughs> so... Yeah. I... I uh, we were kind of left with a bit of, oh, well, that's a bit of a shame, really, because mm. it kind of had the makings of a really interesting, good, yeah. good scenario, didn't it? Um, but just, you know, the craziness of the, of the you know, the great rate of fire and the great uh, direct yeah. mobilization shots, followed by my OBA, my OBA coming down on my own thing, and then my over machine gun guys being done, and my yeah. meter. I mean, I was just like, right, well, look, this, this is, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've messed this up <laughs> in more than one ways. Let's yeah. let's hear the uh, headmaster's report on this one. <laughs> so is, is this is this the turn two one? I think this might be the turn two one. Is it turn two one? Then probably the final thoughts. Let's uh, yeah. Okay, let's, let's hear. Let's hear what he says. Okay, so a few comments on turn two. It certainly looks like the hip issue over some uh, mistakes over the rules is affecting the game more. You know, perhaps some of uh, Martin's units should have been placed on earlier and uh, they are certainly taking their toll on uh, Dave's infantry forces. Uh, I would be interested to know were there any attempts to place smoke uh, from the Stugs um, because I'd have thought that would be a critical thing to do so I can't really comment on the uh, form of Dave's infantry attack, but it does seem to be getting blasted. But at least the reinforcements came on and do appear to have been a surprise to Martin. And I can see an OBA spotting round now. Okay, so it's uh, turn three and game over. Um, Dave's conceded um, after what looks like some, um, some horrific luck on his part and uh, some uh, incredibly good luck on Martin's part with multiple rate of fire, multiple deliberate immobilizations, uh, snipers um, and Dave feeling that he's forced to uh, push his luck and try to get the OBA round down in the right place. But of course it, um, it drifts in exactly the wrong place for him smashed down in the middle of his reinforcements so uh, he's conceded uh, which is uh, which is understandable um i suppose the funny thing is though that um if this was a tournament game i think any tournament director if i was a, if i was the tournament director i'd be saying to uh to martin i'm afraid martin i'm going to have to ask you to concede <laughs> I mean, we can forgive the uh, the hip perhaps at the beginning of the game, although uh, although one's opponent could could make a case about that. But um, 
the other mistake was um, not placing hip units on the board when there was a line of sight to them uh, when they should have been i understand so um and that's that's the defender's responsibility there's nothing the attacker can do that you know it's not it's not their uh, responsibility to keep saying can i see any hip units can i see any more hip units um so uh so yeah technically speaking it's it's lucky this is a friendly game it was a if it was a tournament game um i think there'd be grounds <laughs> to say martin you've messed up the rules so much <laughs> you need to concede but uh but there we are um uh, i'm trying to think what else to uh to comment really you know it's a shame we never shame they never really got into it that much shame we never kept going um um but uh but what can you do um it would have been interesting to to see dave try to encircle something uh, i was looking forward to that but uh but hey ho maybe next time so martin thanks for the game well, I, I did well there i'll, I'll accept your resignation <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not conceding this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm going to cross that off my chalkboard now. Yeah, yeah, yeah rubber, <laughs> rubber for a little win. It was, it was, I, I, well, I never really counted that as a win. I mean, you, yeah. you, you said the words, I concede, I think, but yeah. I never, I didn't, I didn't, I neither of us really thought that was a, a fair game. Yeah. Yeah. It is a tricky one. So, so I mean, I've got some thoughts on it. So, I mean, first of all, thank you, Toby, for a looking at it and you know Absolutely, giving yeah. giving it more attention than it deserved. Yeah. Probably, I, of course, I would have encircled. <laughs> of course, I would have taken prisoners. <laughs> of course, I was trying for smoke. Of <laughs> all of the of all of the things, um, I think the 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 challenge with double blind scenarios is that we've said before about ASL being two guys against a rule book, and and double blind doesn't give you that opportunity really in in mm. this much way, and the issue is, although there's a great element of surprise and there is a great element of this almost feels like a completely fresh new game, we can make mistakes and you know, both of us can make mistakes. There's no, you know, no, none of us are immune to it. And that can render a game broken. You know, yeah. how many times have you or I pulled the wrong counter for a, you know, for a tank or pulled the wrong number of counters for a tank or whatever, you know, or for, mm, for squads yeah. or missed out some leaders? Mm -hmm. And I can't check that and you can't check that. And, and, no. I know you're not going to do it deliberately. You know I'm not going to do it deliberately. But when you're playing either in a tournament or in, you know, wh whatever it is, um, you have no idea, don't we? We have no idea whether the person is being fair or not. I mean, you, you, nobody's going to count the units afterwards. I don't think that's the state of the hobby. No one distrusts anyone, but, it, but it's still an issue. Mm. The other funny story about this one, I don't know if you remember this. So at the end of the mm. story, I was counting your bits and pieces. I was like, what did you get? What did you have? And, and you said, oh, I've got like, 14 concealment counters. I said, oh, I only counted 13. And you did, oh, yeah, yeah, I threw one away to put you off. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you couldn't bomb me off I anything. I forgotten that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you outfoxed yourself on that one, which was yeah. very funny. Um, so, it, I, yeah, I, I think double blind, the problem is, is because, because ASL scenarios take so long to play, if one mistake compounds to become, you know, basically a, a scenario that is not really a scenario. I mean, we're still playing ASL and that was fine. Sure. But it does mean that it's easier to mess up completely, doesn't it? I mean, that's, yeah, the, absolutely. that's yeah. the challenge. Yeah. It was, it was probably one of our least satisfying experiences, perhaps in illuminating rounds. Yeah. And we've had yeah. some, <laughs> we've had some, <laughs> <laughs> some mess up. No thought of the scenario or Toby no, or anything. No, I think, no, I think, no. You know, someone's understanding of hit I, rules. I was, I would, I was interested in, how cavalry and so much horse, so many horses are useful in this scenario. I was right. interested in trying to work that out because it's actually quite difficult. Because when you see it all, you think, "Oh, perhaps I'm going to have to, you know, make a substantial move at some point." But actually, not really. Right. And you, so there was an SSR that said you couldn't move the horses or something for a in the first two or three turns. I yeah. think. Yeah. So yeah, not yeah. sure. Not yeah, sure. cavalry. I'm not sure if it adds much to the the to this particular scenario. Right. Right, cavalry is a yeah. weird one, isn't it? In ASL, that I think a lot of people don't really like horses. And is it scouts out? Is that is that the famous cavalry scenario? I think no idea. One, one yeah. of them is is kind of highlights Ooh. a really good example. Ooh. So here's here's Ooh. a good question for people for, to talk about on the on the YouTube comments. For is is good scenarios with cavalry maybe that yeah. highlight the use of cavalry? 
Um, that would be interesting, yeah. Good to see. Yeah. Well, maybe we could take a look at one of those. Um, yeah. But, I mean, look, Toby, thank you for suggesting it it was always good and fun. persevering yeah. with your bottom set <laughs> <laughs> remedial group <laughs> we um, we'll do better next time we'll try, we'll try we harder try. we did try yeah. i'll um, try harder. Yeah. but this is the thing it's it's you know this is what you get under one i do i do enjoy it i do i did think what's quite nice about um uh the double blind is you haven't got to overthink it too much because you can only you can only react to what you see you don't really yeah. know yeah. very much um, you know, you can't go counting concealment counters or trying to work out oh. where that hip unit is or whatever it is, because you just don't know. Um, oh. And and I was saying to you, you know, it really does make a difference between what um, what this kind of you know feeling of ASL is when you know the order of battle and when you don't. It's, it does make a big mm. big yeah. difference to the, to the scenario. So we'll give it a couple of years and we'll try another one. I'm sure. Um, yes. There's, there's what is, I think there's about is it 15, 20 double blind scenarios around that. I didn't know it was as many as that. I yeah, think there's. Uh, I think the Kansas yeah. City guys have definitely got one, yeah. one set, and I thought there was another, another pack out somewhere from from somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, things to. Yeah. Things to look. We'll at. do it again one day, and we'll try and get the rules right. We will. Or I'll we try will. and get the rules right. Nah, we we, we both we both try. Don't don't worry. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. So on to on to the next one. Let's talk about uh, flying samurais. Yeah. So I enjoyed this. Yeah, you did enjoy this. You did enjoy. It. So flying samurais is. The first scenario in the campaign, the mini campaign, in the new yeah. journal, Journal Fourteen. That's um, right. And a trilogy. Yeah. So tell us, tell us more about it, Martin. Well, yeah. So it's it's it's, it's the campaign. It's, it's a trilogy, isn't it? So it's three three scenarios. That that it's it's and there's there's a, a map for it comes with uh, Journal Fourteen, is it? Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting about it is that it has you can do purchases, sort of sort of most turns can't you both sides and they can kind of dis it's essentially because you can only bring most things in sort of once it's almost like you're just choosing the order of your your reinforcements but there are some interesting decisions there so um so it's quite interesting you know when you i was defending as the australians i think wasn't i and you were attacking mm -hmm. as the japanese and you kind of think oh I, I might just be able to manage this and of course there'd be another big wave of japanese reinforcements right, come on right and then I'd, I'd just be hanging on, but there'd be a big wave of Australian reinforcements coming on. So, yeah, it was it was very interesting in that regard because I've you know I've never quite played anything you know quite like that before. Um, I mean, it's a it's it, it's a, you know, it's quite a big playing area. It's quite a big scenario. It took us most of the day, didn't it, to, yep. to play it through? Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, really nice map, wasn't it? Nice um, thing. We'll, we'll put nice some map. we'll put some photos up. Um, right yeah. Now. So. Um, if we look at the, we've got the nice map up now, so we can see that I kind of start off behind the, the stream um, and you've got some hip guys that you could have purchased mm. and you could, um, I could actually set up um, just very close to this stream. I can kind of come on just to the right of this stream, um, kind of down here. And you said to me, yeah. oh, it'd be a bit sneaky if I hipped someone in this, uh, in this jungle here. <laughs> I didn't think you'd be as mean to do that. So, I gave you a couple of hints. I was like, <laughs> you, you really did. I was r rubbing my hands under the table, thinking, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. So um, yeah, that was the that was kind of the setup. Um, I started mm. kind of pushed on, and um, you know, within uh, a few, well, the first turn, I kind of pushed uh, into this kind of sort of area here. I'd kind of you know got into a little bit of a, a little bit of a, an attacking attacking space um yeah. then <laughs> try to bring on um a big set of uh, like a platoon of J japanese here in the next uh, next few turns yeah. and of course there was someone hip in of this course. in this space yeah. um which did a lot of damage uh got into some close combat and some other bits but you were what you were basically able to do if you were in trouble was just break voluntary break and then yeah. pull back um yeah. And that seemed to be what the uh, the Australians were able to do. Um, yeah. So I think by this stage, I'd got uh, I'd got kind of fairly fairly into the well, I guess to the outskirts of the Australian um, kind of set up areas, and yeah. but uh, I was taking a lot of damage. Um, and we got to this is this is before the end, but we got mm. to uh, we got to the end. Uh, where I basically was 
effectively on the edge of the on the edge of the woods. I think is basically yeah. where, I'd, where I'd got to. Um, yeah. And some of these buildings here as well. Um, oh, and I put that's when I tried to put an ambush, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but you you controlled enough buildings on the uh, on the top here mm. to be able to hold. I did I did grab this uh, mm. two hex building as well. But uh, but yeah. you did win that one. That was a, that was you won it on fair and square. That was, a, that was a <laughs> very game. little cheating. Very yeah, little cheating. But... Um, <laughs> one of the things that was quite clever about the system is that is that you 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 could control how fast your best reinforcements arrive. So for example, the best Australian reinforcements would cost five CPP right. on turns three to five, but if you could wait until turn six to eight, they would only cost you four and that was kind of like typical i think it was the same for you yeah, it was yeah so you had always had to make these kind of decisions about do i need do i need something now in order to kind of hold the line yeah or can i hold on and, and become stronger later and it was, yeah. it was it was very very i think it was very very cleverly done yeah it was it, I, I enjoyed the scenario what it felt like the problem i felt and other people mm. spoke to me and said the same thing that Probably the, the Japanese continue to get weaker and weaker and weaker as they, as Japanese forces yeah. do, you know, and they push mm. the attack. Yeah. And you're pushing into stronger and stronger Australian yeah. forces who have That's less right. to travel. Yeah. And so yeah. you kind of end up with like this kind of impassable force at some point. You can't, yeah. you just can't get past it. It is possible that there's a there's a degree of kind of realism to that. I mean, presumably you put weak forces on the on the, yeah. the front line and you whatever, but. Um, but yeah, it was in, it was interesting. I, it'd be interesting to know actually how it's balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the, you know, if only there was a website. <laughs> that, that's that. Um, yeah. Because um, it, it, I think my suspicion is it is probably a little bit pro-Australian. Um, do you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll put it in and find out. How about that? Okay. Uh, flying. Oh, I've got bits of paper here. And this is taking longer than it yeah. Should, so so, archives got two Japanese yeah. wins, uh, so yeah, yeah. And, and raw uh, very even. So there, there's yeah. no yeah. no apparent yeah. bias. I mean, no. I, I haven't put our one in yet. Um, no, but that's yeah. So, so I mean, look, mm. really enjoyable. Um, yeah, definitely was fun. I, I don't know. So there was there's a campaign that you can play afterwards um, that doesn't have an impact on what was left. In this no. term, was it? So it's not like you've That's got to right. preserve force. So if you play campaign game two, you simply set campaign game two up, I think, basically. I don't think it even impacts how many CPP you get. Right. Anything. You right. Just, you just set the set. So it's just a, yeah. it's just a sequence of scenarios. Right, right. But there is, there is purchasing and stuff, but it goes on in the scenario. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, very, really nice. Uh, nice, yeah. nice to play a nice map. Look, got a lot, drew a lot of nice comments. We were playing it live in the. At the mm. tournament, weren't we? And it, it drew a lot of uh, comments, so yeah, that was absolutely. that was mm. good. Um, I did get my revenge on you. We played. Uh, do, do you know what? I can't even remember. The, do you remember the scenario name we played? I, I can picture it. It was. Um, I can't remember off the top. It was the only same pack. It was. Yeah, it was the same. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's have a quick look. I, I'll even remember it because I can squeeze it. Loser takes all. Loser, Loser takes, takes all. all. That's right. And yeah. that was my amazing German force. That's where I got the. Amazing German tanks and just oh, I crushed yeah. crushed them, <laughs> crushed the Russians with my yeah with my good mm. uh, good stuff. So that was that was good fun afterwards. Um, mm. But yeah, that's that's all that right. Okay, last bits and pieces. Oh, we could talk about the the tournament. So we we're just trying to get the yep. last few tournament games done for this round. I've got my last yep. one to play this weekend, so I'll be I'll be finishing my game up, um, and mm. hopefully we'll be getting up the next round very soon for that. Yeah. Um, in other news, the scenario archive. So, okay, for those that haven't seen, because uh, I posted this in a few different places, but basically how the map data worked with scenarios on the scenario archive was that each scenario can have a number of different maps. And the maps, obviously, so, you know, map five, map six, whatever. The maps really were only just um, strings, like pieces of text attached to each map. So it might have been three pieces of text because there were three maps attached to it, but they didn't really, um, it didn't really uh, have any other realm of what these maps are. And mm. what I did then was um, created a, an ability to attach maps to publications so that you can now see which maps come from which publication. 
And also now you can attach graphics to the map. So now you can hover over the map numbers or letters yep. to be able to see what those maps look like. <clears throat> now, the where, where this leads us to is the ability to um, figure out what maps or what publications are needed to play which scenarios. So if, for example, you fancy playing a particular scenario, but you don't have the maps for it, you can, in theory, search and, and do it. Now, you can't do the search yet, but you will be able to soon. But I have to say a big thank you to Justin, who um, put in all of the... He, he went through all the publications and entered all the data for which publications and which maps, and he yeah. did an amazing job. So, Justin, many, many thanks oh. for that. You did a, did mm -hmm. a great job of that. Um, so soon will come the ability to... Uh, curate your map collection and then so right now if you like for example if you go on to any uh, publication you can see um, which maps uh, so for example um, you know we can see that the journal 14 has the sparrow force the sf bat map next to it um, so in future when we know that scenarios need that map then you can figure out which publication you need whether it's mm. uh, you know, whatever um Big thank you to Justin for that. He did a great job. And look out soon for the ability to, A, figure out what maps you have in your collection so you can oh. do it like perhaps an auto. I'll have some sort of auto calculation by looking at what publications you own or I'll give a list of all the maps and you can tick them and then you can then subsequently search later on on what maps you uh, own for the scenarios you have. So big thank oh. you to, 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 uh, to Justin for that. Justin, um, yeah. Anything else, Martin? No, I think we covered everything. I've got everything ticked off on my list here. We um we don't have another scenario to play. We'll have to think of something to play. Um, is there anything yeah. on the list that we're thinking about playing? Is there something? No, I don't think so. So if this comes out in time, people can certainly make suggestions. But uh, no doubt we will have a, a chat off camera and come up we with will. something we will. exciting that we understand the rules for. That's and, right. Um, and play that, yeah. And one of the patrons suggested a really nice topic that Toby's working on right now. Mm. which was very interesting. So look out for this perhaps next time, which is the best use of leaders at each leadership level, which is yeah. a really nice, nice idea. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's very good. Cause I mean, I suppose there's obvious thing, things like, you know, the six plus ones and things like that. I've seen interesting uh, threads about, you know, yeah. what, you know, what can you actually, you know, there's actually dozens of good uses yeah. for a six plus one, isn't that's there? That's right. That's right. Um, mm. Quick update on Joe Arthur's uh, collection. So he's, yes. he's, uh, he's the kit. Mm. Um, so that, that was sold. Um, and I, I won't say who's bought it just yet, just because they might might want to stay uh, anonymous. But um, the family put half of the money towards uh, Joe's board gaming club. They paid for their the rent for their um, uh, club meetup for a year, and the other half they gave to a local uh, mental health charity. So very very nicely done from the family. Yeah. Um, and thanks to everybody for the interest and um, you know, comments on, on all those bits and pieces. Um, and that kit will go on to get a lot of use. Yeah. And it's and it's yeah. gone to someone who Joe actually encouraged to play as well and, mm. and turned up at the uh, the tournament scene. So basically this person bought some stuff off Joe on eBay and he, Joe had put um, a note to say, hey, you know, come to the tournaments. So mm. that person did. And now, um, you know, it's nice that Joe's uh, kit has now ended up there as well. So... Yeah. Um, hopefully that's a you know a nice a nice end to a sad a sad story and um, yeah it's, mm. it's it's all uh, all's good that uh, ends well or something and yeah that's the that's the mm. end of that. Yeah. Um, other than that, Martin, I guess we're going to play soon and we will get a yeah we'll get a scenario up. Um, Can't wait. Other than that, yeah, that's all for me. Anything for you? All right. Done? Take care. No, I've, I've, oh, I'm finished. I got all done. Good stuff. Okay. All right. We'll take it easy. Take care. Bye-bye.